<laughs> Folks, the sirens are going strong here in Long Beach. Uh, <laughs> joined today by a legendary drummer and quickly becoming a historian in his own right. The drummer from war, Harold Brown. Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Well, thank you for having me back. Welcome to Long Beach. Yeah, I, I, I want to show you something, Jake, yeah, and all you guys. I want to show you show something. Show it, dude. You see that right there? Yeah. I know you that. see her, huh? Okay. You see Lee Oscar right there. You see Charles Miller. He went to Long Beach Poly right back over there. You see Lonnie Jordan. He out of Compton. Howard is straight out of Compton. He might walk, but he was born in he's San tuning. Pedro. Howard Scott's tuning. Wait, hold yeah, he's, he's straight out of Compton. Yeah, but he was born in San Pedro over uh, there two days before me. Uh, and then there go Morris B.B. Dickinson right over here, uh, Wilmington, right over there. A few miles from us in Papa D. I met him out in P Town, He's Pomona. From Delaware, though. Yeah, but I met him in Pomona, out by the L.A. Fair, and that's me sitting at, by the, with the dog in the front, with the, my dog. This picture. That, that's that's war. That's this, the, there's yeah. a, there's a joke going around. I see the the the, the billboards for <laughs> war. But that's not war right now. Well, no. That's the original. Well, war. I'm not trying to say I'm we war or anything, but what do the record? What did the record company call us? Who that is? Now, this picture right here was taken right over here, right back over here on Orange and 21st Street, just when you come off the hill over there. Right back over there. We're about maybe a mile from it. Unbelievable. Right there. So we in our hometown, Long Beach and Compton, San Pedro, all here. This is where we, Charles Miller that sung Lowrider. Charles Miller that sung Lowrider, the voice on Lowrider. He went to Long Beach Poly, right down the street here, less than a quarter of a mile. Long Beach Poly, class of 57. Me, I'm Long Beach Poly, class of 64. And Snoop Dogg come from over there, too. Snoop. <laughs> you know, Harold, let me, let me ask you something about your father. Uh, he planted palm trees right here. Oh, yeah. When so you come to the aquarium. But I guess what I'm saying is, what is it like to be living back where you grew up? What is, on your own, you know, oh, you're not, you're not, it's not like, you know, you're, <laughs> it's gone and, what does it feel like? It's a full circle. One day, I was up on the hill out there, Signal Hill, where me and my brothers used to hunt rabbits when we were kids. There wasn't all the fancy condos, it was just little shacks and some oil wells. And I was driving up over the hill in my little 1998 Ford truck. It needs a paint job, but Al Jarreau Cruz would be in it. Al Jarreau was in there? Rest yeah, in, peace, in my man. little old oh, truck. Man. It's right down, it's right over here, parked up in the garage. <laughs> and I'm over there going the hill. And I said, wow, it's expensive to move back home. Because here, you know, with a, a one bedroom apartment or a condo here, you're spending about $1,800 a month for that. $1,800. And I said, wow, that's a lot. I can go back to New Orleans somewhere where I'm, you know, everything is paid for. Well, yeah, you own a house down yeah. there. But the Holy Spirit, God came to me and the Spirit said to me, Hey, Harold, at your age, at 73, this is priceless where you're at. You can't relive this. So I'm blessed to be able to be in health, and I can roll through the streets where we grew up, all through Long Beach, Compton, San Pedro. Come on now, right over there. And when you go through the streets, I get a chance to relive. I go by the garage where I used to beat on my drums. And Charles Miller came up in there. I go up here by the Watts Tower. Up there by the Watts Tower where I went to jail one time with some of the guys that started the Watts Ride. I go through Compton on School Street where Howard grew up. I drive through the streets where Lonnie Jordan come from. I mean, that's a blessing but to be I able to do But I think that what you're talking about is <laughs> the idea is that the music came out of the community. It was real people. War came right out of this community. Exactly. War came out of uh, between Long Beach, Compton, San Pedro, Wilmington, Delaware, and me up Wilmington, uh, California. It's from here. That's why our music was the way it is. That's why our music is the way it is. All day music. Come on now. You be over here. We're a block and a half away from the ocean by the palm trees that my daddy planted around the uh, aquarium around about 1962, 1963. You, and you see those palm trees blowing and you have to roll the window down and then you get the true essence of what all day music is about or summer. You get the true essence. Howard talked about the, the Latin cats and the, and the, and the African-American cats. That, that, it was that rhythm. 
but your rhythm is so unique to you. How would you describe all day music rhythm? Well, there are rhythms. When we grew up here in Long Beach, it's a multiculturalistic city between here and San Pedro. Everybody lived. When I grew up right over here, I looked out <laughs> and I looked out. The closest black family to me was a half a block away. It was the Scots. And it was mainly uh, Filipinos, Japanese, uh, uh, Fugahara and them just came out to concentration camps from World War II. They just, the, yeah. The, 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 the camps here. Yeah, the camps here in America. In America. Oh, yeah, There's in the America. Concentration camps in America. The concentration camps here in America. The Japanese just come out. It was after World War II. Uh, I had Filipinos, uh, Bobby Montez. I mean, the Greeks, the Germans, Sprechen Sie Deutsch, right over there, First Lutheran, the Germans. I remember some of the old men was telling me back in the mid 50s how people throw bricks through their windows thinking they were Nazis. But yet they were working in the inner cities helping work with black families, Latin families. Oh yeah, see that's what we gotta do. We gotta bring down, we gotta educate people. These haters out there trying to divide us. No, the more we look at each other and we see the journey that we've been through, the Irish, the Italians, hey, come on now. The Italians immigrated over here. They came over here in the 1860s. Oh yeah, the Italian experiment. But they were still looked down upon. Uh, oh they yeah. They were still looked at, but I, okay, so but I, I want you to talk about affecting change on a on a macro level, but being able to do it in your life because you can't change the world, Harold. No, you can't uh, change you the seven dollars to your name, <laughs> and uh, who's the producer that found you? What was the cast? oh yeah. oh you talking Marshall Lee? Lee. Okay, so so the Holy Spirit's been inside of you for a long time. I mean, it's always been there. Yeah, but see, what I found out by coming back here, <laughs> standing in the grocery line and stuff, and I start communicating with people, looking at them straight in the eyes, not rolling my eyes away and doing all that, but looking at you straight, and we talk. Human to human, we start finding that we're more like inside than we're on the outside. We really start finding out. But what do you do when you talk to people that have been doctrinated into groupthink? When every one of their friends is the same, they go to the same spiritual worship place, they don't want to hear anything different. What do you say to them to open their ears? What do I say to open up your ears? There's only one God that created everything on the planet Earth. And we're all, if you can talk about Jesus, you can talk about Muhammad, you can talk about this, but if you don't show love and love thy neighbor as yourself or help that man on the street, it don't mean nothing. It's better to walk in love than to have this division. We can't have division because we all, we all need water. We all need food. We all need love. We all want respect. We got to give respect to the next person. We can't disrespect them because they may have a slightly different uh, belief. I keep seeing some of my homeboys just going by there. <laughs> but my thing is, I believe in showing love to no matter who it is. I remember years ago, I was way up on the highway, up in Los Angeles, cruising down. There was a Marine. I gave him a ride. He was uh, AWOL. I gave him a ride all the way down to to uh, 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 Camp Pendleton. I gave him a few bucks, got some food to eat. Years later, I'm way up on Foothill on the other side of those mountains, right up there by the Foothill Mountains. And who was it? My brother needed a job and his buddy needed a job. And who was the personnel director? I go in there and it was Smokey. No. And then I helped him. He gave my brother a job and his buddy a job. And we hadn't seen each other for a few years. And the last time I seen him, I was at least about 150, 160 miles away. You never know those people you help. It's important to show love and help each other. A lot of it is based on, uh, on uh, I mean, we're one human race. Right. We? But, right? But, but that's where the dividing line comes into play. We have a class warfare, obviously. The rich are getting richer, right? And there's a huge inequality there. So how do you, I mean, you just showed, talk to people out there. The uh, the veteran AWOL veteran uh, yeah Pendleton he, he, story that's a good story yeah that's a great story but how do you what other get, tell me uh, well story. you know I found other stories like there was a young man just moved here from Michigan 
I'm over here on Pacific, back over this way. Yeah. And I'm going to the post office. And I come out and I see him sitting there on a bus stop, on a bench, by a trash can, just reading a book. And I happened to have me a book in my hand I was reading. And I stopped and I looked at him and I, I said, wow, you're reading, what are you reading? And I started talking to him. And then we started talking. Another gentleman came out of recording studio where Snoop Dogg and them guys be hanging out. He comes out and he starts telling this guy who I am. He says, don't you know who he is? whoop de doo because I dress regular, you know, I'm not all in flash. No, you're doing great. And he, he looked at me and says, whoa. And he came here from another state. Yeah, our skin tones was different, but because it took that moment to show him love, you know. And then I had to, I always like to keep $7 on me. Because one, seven dollars. That's right, you were on your last seven. And that was on my last seven. How many kids did you have then? Ooh, three. Three, had three yeah, kids. Three and you kids. Seven, don't oh, yeah, them. three. And I, oh, and my uh, other daughter, Siobhan. Yeah, she's a blessing. So, you know, at that time, there was four kids. But the thing was, this young man, by me stopping, I was talking to another guy, and I went back and I said, I got to take care of something. I go over, he sat on the book, and I took that seven dollars and laid it on there and said, Love you, young man, don't give up. And I took off, and I seen him run into the grocery store because he came here and he felt if he's going to be homeless, he'd rather stay in a certain neighborhood. I've had another young man. I was walking by and I seen him, and he was all upset over here on Ocean, come from Ocean. He was mad. The first thing I do when I see somebody's got an attitude upset, so I don't show any kind of uh, aggression. I took my hat off, put my hand behind my back, and I says, "Yes, young man." Don't you understand the devil is trying to take a hold of you? He's getting you all upset. Chill, take a break. I let him vent. I put my hands behind my back. And I let him vent. And then he vented. And then finally I knew I had a few bucks. I always keep that seven. And I had a brochure in my pocket. I carry, you know, it's, it's a brochure, you know, a pocket guide to help out the homeless wow. and people. So I got that and I went back and I gave him a few bucks. Okay, now I hadn't seen him for a long time. So the other week after I came back, I was here, and I went walking around the way, and I came by a bus stop, and there he was. He says, whoa, there you are. I thought you died, or somebody killed you or something. I didn't know where you was at. And he says, my life, thank you. Now I can eat every day. I can eat every day. I got a place to sleep, and, and now, and he starts showing me brochure. He's going to school. He's going to school. <laughs> The kids that you work with, though, do they feel? Do do they have inspiration? I mean, I think you guys, even through the Watts riots and that stuff, was so overt. It was so evident. People could see it every night on the evening news. There was only three TV channels. I feel like there was hope. Your music, the war's music, exudes hope. The younger cats that you're working with at, at uh, the Lutheran, uh, yeah, over the, the gather, gather. The right, gather. right, right, the gather. Do they do they have hope in their Do they have hope in their eyes? Oh yes. Tell oh, me yes. Tell me about it. What I love about it. <laughs> The biggest enjoyment I get out of it, and the biggest high, because even though weed and everything is legal here now, I don't even smoke anymore. For some reason, I just get, I don't have the contact. You get a contact yeah, on I get it, doesn't matter. I'm over here. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so then, I'm, the biggest you know, high I get is when I see a young man or a young person walking down the street and they're with another group of kids or their parents or their sister, and they turn around and see me and they wave and they wave at you. That is the thing. It's far greater to have your name written on people's hearts than to have it written in stone. Amen, dude. And then I like that because just getting out, doing good, or you see, you know, you're out picking up trash. I got a letter the other day from uh, Pomona, California, because I moved from Pomona to, back to Long Beach. That's where, Papa, that's where you met that's Papa, where I met Papa, Papa D. That's gas station there. Right. I got a gentleman from uh, uh, old, uh, uh, Rainwater. Gene Rainwater and Gene Ginger. Rainwater. Yeah, that's his name, Rainwater. He used to work here, work down by the police department, work in the building. He sent me a beautiful letter. He says, Harold, Pomona ain't the same without you and Cindy here. Pomona is not the same anymore. Wow. I mean, see, when you get stuff like that, make a difference in your neighborhood. I don't care what belief you may be or this and that. But make a difference in your neighborhood. Reach out and talk to your neighbor. Show love to your neighbor. It, it doesn't hurt for you to go out and if they're senior citizens, or I call it old school values, you can pull in their trash cans. 
You can even pull out the trash cans when you're putting yours out. If you see trash out in the alley or trash on the street, go get you some gloves or whatever, or some plastic bags, and pick the trash up. Tell and, me, about, what is, when did Snoop Dogg get hip to you? Did he bring oh, you to Snoop Dogg? I want to know when Snoop got, uh, got hip to you. Oh, he was, he was just a baby. Yeah, tell me about that. He was on, he, he used to come over here on Hill Street, Hill and uh, Lemon. But we used to rehearse. How, old, far was from How old was he? Oh, shucks. He was old. He still was riding his bicycle. Uh, <laughs> wait, 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 War was rehearsing. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, he, uh, he and told Snoop me, uh, was coming over on his bike. He was coming over on I his love bike. It. I love he it. came over and he used to come over there and see us on, uh, see us when we was rehearsing over on Hill and Lemon. Oh, man. <laughs> right down, right down the street here. This is where you get to those hills over there. Does and he does he give back to the community? Does he, yes, he does. What, in what ways? I, well, I think, he worked with like he worked. He likes to work with a lot of the uh, football camps, right? Sports camps like at Long Beach Poly. He works here. Uh, he does fundraisers and stuff for the city, and so forth. I'm trying to get back with him so maybe we can start working on some maybe some summer camps, music camps here in the city. Yeah, it seems to me it's he's working sports. He should be doing music. Oh yeah, but he he you know he, he likes those sports. He does. No, but I mean like. You said all the hip hop producers love the funky sound of Harold Brown. When hip hop, what was the first hip hop tracks that you were that you remember Whoa. getting sampled on? Because I mean, that, that's a there was so many out there. I lose track. Like a lot of them, uh, like that heartbeat. Listen to my heartbeat is beating mighty funky. Boom 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 boom. And the one that they still love, and Tupac wanted me on his last album. I found out. He did. Slipping in the darkness. But he was, that he was going to sample. The, that was the name of the tune? Oh, well, no, he was doing, he's going to, he liked the drum track uh, like I, I was doing. Yeah, well, I don't blame him, dude. No, he likes that drum track. And I found out from his bass player, I was talking to his uh, bass player. He's over with my son, Daryl Lewis Brown, over in Japan. And he got on the phone, he says, Bro, I never thought I could tell you this. I never thought I could tell you this story. But Tupac wanted you on his album. That groove that you playing on Slipping in the Darkness on the drums? He had a drummer come in. It was in New York. He played it. He played it great, but he didn't play it like you. So he sent him away. Then he had another drummer come in. He played it. He played it great, but he didn't have that thing that you got. The feel. That feel. Uh, the and feel. I got... love that feel. It's the Harold Brown feel. <laughs> well, you know, you got to have your own thing. That's right. <laughs> and then he tried to program it. He did everything they could do to program it. And it still didn't work. So he sent everybody home and left. I always wondered, when we were back east on a, doing a bus tour, and I remember Tupac coming on the bus, he walked past everybody, he had one of his guys with him, he came past everybody, he shook my hand and gave me a big hug. And I didn't know why, until his bass player told me that story. <laughs> Can you talk about the dowels that you used to use, that used to go, in, out of, that used to go down to the, uh, the, the wood yard and pick them out? Uh, when I go to the they, wood they make them now. They they make you talking about brushes in our first radio interview. Oh, wood store or something, and I would go, and they had these things almost look like straws, but wooden straws, and they're wood. And and actually, I seen was Is that it, good for the environment? Probably better than plastic. Oh yeah, right? but uh, but the one that hit me on it was Johnny Cash's drummer. W. S. Holland. Yeah, he was the one. W. S. Holland. Yeah, well, Johnny Cash is the original drummer. Oh my God, I interviewed that. Are you? Yeah, I and then when he you, showed. Yeah, go no, ahead. this was years ago, and he just took and he showed me, and I was listening to him play, and then he showed me what he did. He went and got a bunch of the, you know, the uh, wooden, you know, the wood uh, like, whatever they call, want to call them, looked like straws, but there was wood. And then he would go buy them and put them together. So many, and then he would just take some tape or gaffer's tape or something and wrap it around it. And that's what we'd use. How and then how did that change the sound when you would hit the drums? It gave it, it still gave it a swing like brush, but it gave it more of a impact. Pam, pam, pam. And then, so then I could use it like in uh, if we were in a nightclub settings. It would still have enough. It would, it would still have a little enough sonic palette. And it, right, and it just had that slap. Because if you did it with you know regular standard brushes, the metal brushes. You didn't still get, you don't get it because there's too soft and it's a different setting. And depending on the size of the club and the ambiance, you know, what you would get. What, um, do you have any, can you just talk to the audience? I mean, I drive in New Mexico or Tucson, Arizona, and I'm seeing billboards with war, come to see war. And there's some cat, I guess, the one of the original cats who's fronting the band. 
Yeah, Lonnie. Lonnie. Right. Okay. But he's going around using the same name of the band. It's not the same band. You have any anything that any was there? I mean, I know Lee and Howard. They got their own issues with it. But wh where do you stand as far as the fact that I mean, should it be called War? John Densmore sued Krieger and Manzarek so that they would not go on the road and call themselves the Doors. He didn't care if it was the Doors of the 21st century, the new Doors. He was doing it for Morrison. And I just wonder what, how you feel about it, where you come down on that whole thing. Well, first of all, I love Lonnie. Lonnie. I got no hate for him. Okay. Too loud. <laughs> We're almost done. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's right there. Yeah. L so, you love Lonnie. I love Lonnie. But... My whole thing is, I don't mind it. I just wish that those guys would make another hit. Why? Because then I'd make more money. <laughs> <laughs> but you have no qualms. I don't have with no them qualms. going around saying it, it, they want to do. Yeah, they want to be out there. They can do it. Give give some uh, words of inspiration uh, to the audience I, I out think, there. Uh, I mean, I feel like we are we the sell by date. We passed that expiration a long time ago. I know you went through Watergate. Uh, oh we've no, been I'm through not some the... shit, but I, I just uh, show some upful. Uh, give some inspiration to the peeps around the well, world. Well, me myself, I just try to do what I can do locally with my neighbors and stuff. Like my neighbors just came and was saying, right. they, they must be right up front here, they can hear they, me. Everybody knows you here. Yeah. But then I don't want to disturb them too. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you know, all those guys, Lonnie, go and support Lonnie. Support our music. Keep buying our music. We really appreciate you buying our music because that's the thing that makes it happen for us. And I'm just giving a big shout out to Lonnie. Keep on grooving. And then I'm seeing all the rest of the guys, Sal and all of them, you know. You guys, go on and keep making that money. But write another hit, and then we'll all make money. You can't write, you can't make a hit, though. You know that. None of your songs, <laughs> they, just, they just worked out that way, right? You can't make a hit. Yeah, but, no, but, well, you know, there's certain ingredients, but it's the ingredients that takes to make a hit. Because when we were coming up, yeah. What made us? Can you show some of these albums? Uh, that's all what, music made us, what made us hits, made us a hit, was B.B. Dickerson, Howard Scott, Sylvester Papa D. Allen, Lonnie Jordan, Charles W. Miller, Lee Oscar, and myself. Yeah, it's called a team. And what it was, there was an ingredient there. And when you got that ingredient, well, what's that ingredient? Love. Uh, love, but then the input that each person puts into the stone soup. Uh, you know that book. <laughs> I know that book. And then that's what it is. Harold Brown, <laughs> I'm glad we got to do part two, man. Much love to you, brother. <laughs> Much love to you. <laughs> God bless. Peace. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. See you later. <laughs>